Good morning, everyone. I hope everybody's having a good weekend. Uh, for those of you who's following the March Madness brackets, I'm sorry for your bracket. <laughs> um, I had Kentucky going to the, the finals, and uh, yeah, I'm kind of upset about it. I don't think I'll recover. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and uh, get started today. I'm going to be talking about um, uh, the current kind of uh, aspects of our current political situation um, and democracy or fascism. Um, uh, but I want to start with a reality check. Uh, so to the left here on your screen is a picture of myself on the far left, uh, B. Lumpkin in the middle, and my wonderful partner, uh, Felix. Uh, Felix is, is a trans man. Uh, he is a nursing student here in Peoria, Illinois. Um, and in 2023, he had a great opportunity to go participate in a, a free clinic in rural Tennessee. Uh, this was really exciting for him. Uh, he had the opportunity to go and practice the skills that he'd been learning in nursing school um, uh, out in kind of like the real world outside of clinical. I know clinical is kind of the real world, but uh, but he also got to participate and, and do some. It was for a good cause, you know, going and, and participating in a free clinic really helps like lower income people. Um, so he was really, really excited for this. Unfortunately, as he was preparing to leave for this opportunity, Tennessee state government banned male and female impersonators uh, in public. This was through their anti-drag uh, show bill, and it was uh, mainly targeted towards adult performers, but people in the LGBTQ community, including Felix, uh, felt as though um, the underdefining of the, of the law made it to where uh, trans people could be charged with a class A misdemeanor uh, for simply existing in public. So what was really an exciting moment for Felix turned into a decision uh, that he was really anxious about. Um, he did decide to go. Uh, he didn't face any problems, luckily. Uh, but that bill was actually had stopped its implementation uh, and now is currently under an appeal process. Um, but in 2023 totally, uh, there was 185 bills nationwide that attacked gender affirming health care. This year, in three months, so January, February, and March, um, we have already seen a total of 132 bills nationwide attacking gender affirming care. Another reality check that I want to talk about is the NAACP travel advisory uh, that they released in 2023 for the state of Florida. Um, quote, please exercise extreme care in all parts of the state. That was their warning for people of color um, and LGBTQ individuals specifically as they uh, decided if they wanted to go to Florida or not during this time period. Uh, in preparation for this presentation, I actually reached out to my local NAACP and asked uh, the president, Pastor Marvin Hightower, his thoughts on the travel advisory. And he shared some pretty crucial information with me. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, the NAACP has now expanded uh, that travel advisory to include student athletes who are, preparing, who are preparing to go to universities, um, and they're advising those student athletes not to go to Florida. They're saying do not go to Florida universities. On a personal note, uh, when Pastor Hightower uh, last year, he was preparing on going to uh, a vacation. Uh, and Florida was one of the destinations that he was going he was going to go to because his best friend from Bible school was there um, and he wanted to visit them. But when this travel advisory came out and he looked into Florida, um, he decided to cancel that altogether and chose a different place to go. But why Florida? Why did the NAACP choose Florida for this? And why did Pastor Hightower, you know, decide to to go in step with this travel advisory? Well, it's because of the Florida blueprint. Right. And it's called the Florida Blueprint because this is what the far right uh, wants to expand into every state. But this is what they've been able to achieve in Florida. Uh, one, it consists of criminalizing protests. Um, it consists of attacking uh, teachers for teaching African-American history. Uh, it consists of union busting. It consists of the attack on public education through privatization. And of course, it includes anti-LGBTQ legislation. Um, examples of these policies would be found in like Florida Senate Bill 256. Um, that's an attack on public unions uh, because it prohibits paycheck deductions for union dues um, and increases the uh, required employee threshold to 60 percent. 
those uh, unions that can't meet those thresh thresholds are uh, uh, are potentially um, um, decertified. Another example, uh, and this one is an example of criminalizing protests, uh, is their anti-riot law. Uh, one of the tactics that the far right uses um, in their legislation is making it to where uh, their definitions aren't as defined as they should be, uh, leading to broad interpretations of the bill. And the anti-riot law, what it does is it allows for um, uh, the interpretation that some peaceful protests can be classified as riots uh, therefore, um, they're eligible to be to be treated as one. Um, uh, that is just one part of the repression that the the Florida government, the Florida right, ha has done. Um, but also um, to further it, uh, talking talking back about the the NAACP travel advisory, uh, Florida Senator Rick Scott, a Republican uh, senator, responded to the NAACP uh, travel advisory with a travel advisory of his own this time for socialists visiting Florida. Quote, Florida is openly hostile towards socialists and communists and those that enable them. Florida is openly hostile towards socialist, communists, and those that enable them. I think it's really important as members of the Communist Party, we realize that he's not talking to us. We might fit into these categories. We absolutely fit into these categories, and he definitely doesn't like us, right? But he is directing this travel advisory to the NAACP, and this is an example of repression. We've seen so often in our country's history that that the ruling class will use anti-communism, anti-communist sentiments to break down progressive movements, and they're using it today, and they're using it against the NAACP, which is definitely not a communist organization. Right. Um, the last reality check that I'm going to talk about is the insurrection um, on January 6th, 2021, the MAGA movement stored in the Capitol. Right. Um, I feel like a lot of us, um, including myself at times, are somewhat desensitized to what happened um, on January 6th. Um, the reality is that thousands of people gathered outside of the Capitol building, they built gallows calling for members of Congress to be strung up. And then they stormed it as a mob with zip ties to take hostage members of Congress and do who knows what with them, right? The reality is that this wasn't just an insurrection. This was a failed fascist coup. And not only did was there a mob that supported this, uh, but according to a People's World article called Investing in Fascism, um, 139 members of Congress, almost solely funded by the corporate class to the tune of $237 million, uh, decided to vote in tandem with them to decertify the election. But what is fascism? As Marxist-Leninists, uh, the, the common definition that, that is often used is the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary and most chauvinistic and most imperialist elements of finance capital. Uh, when I first heard this definition, I kind of felt that it was a little overwhelming. Um, so what I've done is kind of set it up into three different sections and I re, uh, reorganized it a little bit to better explain it. Um, so the first section I want to talk about is finance capital. Uh, finance capital, um, this is, in my opinion, one of the most important aspects of the definition uh, because unlike many definitions of fascism, what this section does is add a class character to the definition. Um, and that class character is finance capital. Well, what is finance capital, right? Uh, finance capital um, is is better kind of defined as monopoly capital. You know, we see this in a lot of the literature that the CPUSA uh, releases. Uh, monopoly is like the, the domination of markets. Um, and there's examples of finance capital that we know, right? It's like the, uh, the Coke Industries um, that's famously owned by the Coke brothers. Uh, who funds a lot of the right wing, right -wing think tanks? Um, they have a, a the, the Coke Industries is a multinational conglomerate, meaning that you know they're in different countries all around the world, um, and they're a conglomerate, meaning that they're part of multiple different industries. You know they have large market shares in and not just one industry, but a lot of different industries. 
another example of, of monopoly capital would be something like BlackRock, right? That's an investment firm um, that has large shares in pretty much the entirety of the U.S. market. You know, you can you can follow the money and see that that BlackRock has investment in, in not just one company in the market, but pretty much the entire market as a whole. Um, but it's not just monopoly capital itself. Um, it's a certain section of monopoly capital. And that brings us to the uh, the second uh, uh, section of the definition, which is the most reactionary, most chauvinistic, and most imperialist elements, right? So reactionary is the idea of being uh, anti-reform, right? Or uh, pro-status quo, or keeping the power uh, in the hands of people who already have it. Uh, chauvinistic is um, is the idea of being uh, one group is superior to another. You know, we see this in racism, sexism, homophobia, um, you know, uh, those aspects. And then imperialist, you know, uh, that's a big Marxist kind of term, but uh, basically the idea of, of taking the wealth and resources from around the world, around the world and bringing it back to a one country. Um, so it's those aspects of monopoly capital that's what we're talking about it's that section and that section has an open terrorist dictatorship so again dictatorship is another marxist leninist term um, that's often kind of uh it, it doesn't mean what the modern definition of dictatorship is you know dictatorship we think of like authoritarianism but in a marxist sense it's uh it's more of the idea that one class is dominated over or has domination over another class and we've seen this throughout history right you know you have the slave master and the slave that's a dictatorship uh you have uh the lord and the serf that's a dictatorship you have uh the capitalist and the working the worker that's a dictatorship right we see that all across society but this is where the open terrorist part becomes really really important in the definition because the power that we do have as working class people and we do have power as working class people. You know, we have fought tooth and nail for for a sliver of democratic rights in our society, um, and and the ability to build mass movements. Right, we do have power as working class people. That is threatened under an open terrorist dictatorship, and is is being ripped from us. So it is these three sections of fascism um, that, uh, or these three characteristics that make fascism. And there's different sides to the argument, right? Um, there's some people who who currently believe that that the United States is currently a fascist government. Um, that it doesn't matter if it's Republicans or, or, or Democrats, uh, they're both fascist parties. And then on the other hand, you have those who believe that there is no fascist danger. Uh, that that both parties are just, you know, regular capitalist parties, and uh, there's no distinction between them. But they're they're not they're not classified as fascism. Um, both of these arguments, in my opinion, are are incorrect. Um, I think that we, we kind of we we can look at the Democratic Party, right? And they are by no means perfect. Um, you know, there's a lot of issues within the Democratic Party, but there are forces within the Democratic Party that we can see that are fighting to expand voting rights. Uh, that are fighting against reactionary policies, right? Fighting against deregulation, fighting against, um, um, you know, fighting for power for labor movements, right? We also see that um, there's aspects of fighting against chauvinism. Um, you know, we we've seen that. So I wouldn't I wouldn't classify the government that we have right now as a fascist government at all. Uh, but let's let's dive a little bit deeper into fascism. Uh, so here I have a couple quotes by by Georgi Dimitrov. Uh, Dimitrov was a Bulgarian communist uh, who was really a trailblazer in fighting against fascism, especially in Germany, but also a trailblazer in defining what fascism was. Uh, so the first quote I want to talk about is fascism is the power of finance capital itself. Um, this quote is, is really, really important because uh, we kind of talked about earlier the idea that, you know, it's the, the finance capital is kind of the class character of fascism. Um, but I think this quote really highlights the idea that that fa or fascism is not separate from class struggle. Fascism is class struggle itself. Uh, the next quote I'm going to talk about is the development of fascism um, assumes different forms in different countries. So fascism, what it looks like in one country is not going to be the same or what it looks like, you know, in a completely different country. Um, and uh, I can't remember where I read this. If, if someone knows, please let me know. But I read somewhere that to to look at what the United States would look like under a fascist government, we can't look 
at Germany or Italy, but instead we need to look at Jim Crow, right? Um, uh, and I, I, I completely agree with that. I also would add to that, not only Jim Crow, but we need to look at like the Red Scare in the 1920s. Uh, we need to look at McCarthyism in the 1950s and see how the ruling class has used uh, repression uh, in order to squash working class movements um, to kind of see what fascism at its full force would look like. Um, and if that's the case, that that's going to be really scary um, if they're able to win. Uh, the next quote I want to talk about uh, is whoever does not fight against the growth of fascism is not in a position to prevent the victory of fascism, but on the contrary facilitates that victory. Um, this is where I think it's really important for us to be able to accurately define um, what part of the battle we are in when it comes to fascism. So going back to those two arguments, um, you know, some believe that fascism already exists here in the United States and it already has power. And those who believe that the fascist threat doesn't exist at all, um, this is where they are facilitating the victory of fascism because both of those arguments, they almost treat the government the same. You know, they, they don't, they're not accurately identifying the forces uh, within the country um, and, and they're, they're not doing anything to really help uh, stop the growth of fascism. Uh, the last quote I want to talk about from Dimitrov is uh, fascism expresses the weakness of the bourgeoisie itself, you know, bourgeoisie being the capitalist, right? No longer in a position to maintain its dictatorship over the masses by the, by the old mess methods. Um, this is actually kind of an inspiring quote for me um, because what he's, what he's saying here is that fascism manifests itself because the capitalist system is being weakened um, and working class people are winning. You know, the, the tides of history can no longer be held um, and, uh, and the working class is on its way to, to victory, you know, and to, towards liberation. Um, and Togliatti would define this as like a, a revolutionary crisis. And that's who I'm gonna talk about next is uh, Palmiro Togliatti, who was an Italian fascist, um, who, or sorry, Italian communist, who was arrested and imprisoned uh, by Italian fascists. Um, and the first quote that I wanna talk about is a direct response to the Dimitrov quote, which is the more the fascism movement grows, the more acute the revolutionary crisis becomes. Uh, so that, that weakening of, of, of capitalism is that revolutionary crisis. Uh, but what Togliatti is saying here is that fascism represents a real solution for monopoly capital. Fascism represents a real solution for monopoly capital. Um, that's incredibly important to realize because if we're not fighting it, it's fascism, we're not stopping it, um, then that weakening of capitalism starts not to become a weakness. Um, and we're back at stage one. The next two quotes I'm going to talk about are very similar, so I'm going to talk about them at the same time. Uh, fascist ideology contains a series of heterogeneous ingredients, it serves to solder together various factions and the struggle for dictatorship over the working masses and to create a vast movement for this scope. Fascist ideology is an instrument created to bind these elements together. And the second quote, two elements of fascism the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, or bourgeoisie and the movement of the petty bourgeois masses. What are you saying, petty bourgeoisie? That Petty bourgeois, that's like small business, right? Um, these two quotes are incredibly important because I feel like it's, it's adding on to the definition that we talked about earlier. Not only is fascism the open terrorist dictatorship of the worst sections of monopoly capital, but it is also in tandem with a mass movement. Um, and that's incredibly important to realize. So what is that mass movement uh, for the fascists here in the United States? Well, that's the MAGA movement. Uh, the MAGA movement is, uh, identifies all the, uh, all the, the characteristics of fascism. It is the most reactionary, right? Uh, they fought for the overturn of Roe v. Wade and they were very successful. Um, they, they fought for massive deregulation. The Trump administration released a document that said every one new regulation that, that came about during his administration, eight policies were deregulated. Um, and that's primarily on business, right? And of course, there is the attack on democracy. Not only did they try to overturn a democratic election, which is the biggest attack on democracy that there can be. But there's also legislation out there that is an attack on democracy. You know, you have states all across the country that are enacting uh, state uh, state ID laws, right, or requi required ID laws. 
uh, enabled to vote or in order to vote. We also have the attack on like polling places, especially in uh, communities of color. Um, and that leads us to the most chauvinistic. Uh, one of the theories that are often preached at the MAGA movement uh, is replacement theory. The idea that, that immigrants and people of color are replacing the white vote, that is a racist theory. Um, of course, you have their anti-LGBTQ legislation, their anti-Black history uh, legislation, their anti-Black uh, legislation. Uh, and finally, they are the most imperialist. Um, both parties by far are imperialist. No, nobody's, nobody's arguing uh, that, that the Democratic Party does not have imperialist characteristics. Uh, but the MAGA movement represents something different. Uh, they've kind of um, started this new Cold War with China, uh, and of course, Trump increased sanctions on Cuba and Venezuela after the Obama administration started to uh, to pull back on those policies. Now, of course, the Biden administration have kept those up, um, but I'm going to talk about their imperialist nature of the MAGA movement in a couple of slides, so I'll, I'll leave that um, uh, next. Um, but first, I want to connect the the MAGA movement to monopoly capital. There's a lot of different organizations in the MAGA movement. Uh, I only picked two and I immediately found connections to Monopoly Capital. Uh, the first one I wanna talk about is Turning Point USA. That is a conservative uh, student youth organization that's found across the country in high schools and colleges. Um, it's received $2.2 million since 2014 uh, from the owners of the company Uline. Uh, if you've worked in a warehouse, I know you know Uline right? Like that's that's where a lot of uh, warehouse supplies come from. Um, they've also received large donations from uh, people like Darwin Deason, who is a large shareholder from Xerox. Uh, and of course, they've received funding from the Koch brother, brothers, you know, we've talked about earlier is from Koch Industries. Uh, the second organization I'm going to talk about is the Heritage Foundation. Uh, the Heritage Foundation is a far right think tank. Um, and uh, uh, they they kind of are at the front of a lot of the different policies that the Republican Party has put into law. You know, this is where they develop those policies and those 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 pieces of legislation. Uh, they do something kind of cute <laughs> where they say like, oh, we're only funded by two percent corporations, uh, but like seventy six percent individual donations, um, and we have five hundred thousand members that donate or whatever. But uh, donors are not all equal, right? Um, just looking at the report from 2022, uh, we found that uh, eight of the uh, eight total people and indiv individuals and foundations donated a million dollars just one year. Uh, Eleven donated a half a million dollars, and 83 donated 100,000. Um, and those individuals and foundations that are donating that amount of money, I don't know any working class people who who can donate that much. Um, but I, I looked at some of those those people because it's all public information um, and found uh, that they're connected to things like oil tycoons um, and different like large conglomerates. Um, now I work in the nonprofit industry and I can I can say that I'm very frustrated the fact that there's this amount of donations uh, in these nonprofits. Uh, I can't. Uh, a lot of times I can't seem to scrape together two nickels uh, to help support my food pantry. Um, but uh, these companies are, are, are just, you know, shelling out millions and millions of dollars to, to keep these uh, afloat. Um, but it's not just uh, their donors. You know, these are nonprofit organizations and they have some type of leadership, whether that be like a board of directors or a board of trustees or whatever they want to call it. And it didn't take long for me to look at these two organizations and immediately find connections to Monopoly Capital. Uh, the Heritage Foundation, for instance, uh, I looked at their board of trustees um, and the first person I clicked on was the chair. And she is also on the board of trustees for Alticorp, which is a large hoard holding corporation uh, that just also happens to own uh, the large corporation Amway, uh, right? So there, these connections to Monopoly Capital are there. But let's talk a little bit more about uh, what Heritage Foundation is doing. Um, Heritage Foundation uh, has this, uh, this project called Project 2025. Um, according to Project 2025's uh, website, uh, they are a broad coalition of conservative organizations. Uh, going back to that togli uh, Togliati 
uh, add on to the definition of fascism, right? The, the mass movement aspect, you know, that exists here within that Project 2025. Um, and there's four different pillars of Project 2025, but I want to talk about the fourth one, which is their playbook. Uh, the playbook is, represents a game plan uh, for the first 180 days of the next conservative administration, or what they hope to achieve in November, right? Um, and this playbook is 916 pages. I did not read all of it, but I did, I did skim through the different sections. Um, and yeah, pretty much anywhere you turn on there, it's just, it's just terrible pieces of legislation. But I think it's really important to realize that Project 2025's playbook it's not just what they want to do in 180 days uh, of, the, of, the, of a conservative administration, but it's what they can do in the first 180 days. Um, so that combination is really deadly, but let's, let's talk about it. Um, the first section I wanna go over is the military aspects. Uh, this is where I return to, to the idea that the MAGA movement is absolutely the most imperialist um, section of monopoly capital or part of that movement, right? Um, the whole document is is filled with hostile rhetoric towards China, not in a Cold War sense, but in a much more physical, actual war sense uh, with China. And nothing kind of proves this point more than the quote, uh, whether we're talking about the military uh, and restore war fighting as its sole mission. mission. Let me repeat that. They want to, from the military, restore its war fighting as its sole mission. Now we've seen in, in the history of the United States, we've seen the, uh, the United States use rhetoric like, oh, we need to build a strong national defense um, to kind of justify uh, increasing the military budget. We've seen the United States uh, use the rhetoric of, we need to be peacekeepers um, in the world, you know, the police uh, of, of uh, international uh, affairs, right? This is something completely different. This is just being completely mask off with it and saying, we want a hostile war fighting military uh, to fight China. Um, so, so already right there, that's, that's one of the most scary parts of this document, but it continues. Uh, labor, uh, they want to quote, reverse the diversity, equity and inclusion revolution and labor policy. That's attacking people of color, that's attacking uh, LGBTQ community, that's uh, attacking women. Um, it's attacking the broad working class, right? And we've seen that they've already wanted to do this. You know, They've overturned affirmative action. Um, but another really scary aspect of their labor policy is that they want to weaken the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the National Labor Relations Act came about in the 1930s, um, and it was really represented the first time that the federal government, um, you know, uh, put forth the idea that workers should have the right to organize uh, and collectively bargain. Um, you know, that was the first time that they put it really into law. Um, and from that birth, the National Labor Relations Board uh, which the Starbucks uh, workers, for instance, have been able to use uh, brilliantly in fighting against uh, union busting from Starbucks. Um, what they want to do with the National Labor Relations Act is uh, let states ignore it as long as they provide some type of substitute for it. But what this does is it completely gets uh, corporations in certain states away from having to deal with the National Labor Relations Board, which is very, very scary for the labor movement. Uh, education, I just put a quote here because it's really all I needed to say. Uh, federal education policy should be limited and ultimately the Federal Department of Education should be eliminated. That's their game plan. They wanna weaken public education as much as possible. But not only that, they wanna weaken government's involvement in education. Um, and then also there's the health aspects. Uh, quote, prohibit Planned Parenthood from receiving uh, Medicaid funds. Um, Planned Parenthood is so much more uh, than, than being able you know, to go and get an abortion there. Um, it, it's been extremely important for, for people like Felix, uh, for instance, that he's gone there to get his testosterone. It's also really important for uh, low income communities. Uh, you know, that's where you can get um, birth control or sexual protection like condoms. Um, you can also get tested for things like STDs and STIs. It's really just overall important to the general health of communities. Uh, but something I found interesting in looking at the Department of Health and Human Services Department um, section of Project 25's playbook is that they highlight the intersection between trans rights and female bodily autonomy themselves. 
because when they're attacking one they're attacking the other at the same time and they'll say that it's i find it very sad but also very fascinating that they will highlight that intersection themselves uh, so that's incredibly important to realize so so this project 2025 playbook um uh what it represents what it really is is the agenda for the trump administration right you know the writings on the wall we we know what's going to come up in, in in november it is going to be a battle between biden and a battle between trump we know this you know uh that's the reality that we're dealing with um and this is what the trump administration is looking to do uh and we really we really need to fight against it but our what, what's our alternative right it's the biden administration biden has been complicit in genocide Biden has uh, has stopped, you know, things like the railroad strike, right? He's uh, he's gone and uh, you know tried to expand NATO, right? All these imperialist aspects. Um, but I want to I want to kind of caution this and take a step back from looking at it just as Biden and Trump, and kind of looking at it as uh, the tale between two governors, too, right? Um, and I'm going to use the Illinois example. We already talked about the Florida blueprint, uh, but I want to talk about the Illinois example for a second. Uh, Illinois has a very similar govern governor to what Biden would represent, and that's J.B. Prickster. Um, J.B. is, well, he's just outwardly a billionaire. You know, he comes from one of the richest families in the world. Um, he is also very complicit in genocide. Uh, he, I wouldn't say that he, he's a, a, a hardcore progressive like the, the squad or anything like that. Um, but this is what working class people in the mass progressive mass movement has been able to achieve under JB. Um, the first one is the Safety Act, which, in my opinion, is one of the most revolutionary uh, pieces of legislation in the entire country. Uh, what the Safety Act does is uh, remove um, the requirement to pay for for bail uh, when you get arrested and before you're tried uh, for in a trial. Um, that has been a huge, uh, huge relief off of a lot of uh, uh, low income families and just working class families in general, because um, no longer are people being held hostage uh, for days. Uh, sometimes I've seen even weeks or months um, uh, because they can't afford to pay bail. Uh, the second one is community control of police. This, uh, that was a version of that was passed in Chicago. Um, the third one is the Worker Rights Amendment. As a lot of red states have been uh, battling with this right to work for less legislation, uh, the Illinois uh, labor movement was able to get the right for workers to uh, organize uh, and collectively bargain solidified in the state's constitution. Um, then there's the Illinois Reproductive Health Act uh, that uh, solidifies the right to, to have an abortion. Uh, and then there's the Patient Provider Protection Act uh, that was really instrumental in uh, protecting gender affirming care. Now, all of these things, I wanna make it very clear. Um, JB, he didn't do these things. He, he was not the, the person, he was not a savior to the working class people. He did not come in and do all these great things for us. That's not the reality of the situation. The reality is that these things came about because of a mass movement and a progressive mass movement, right? The, Safe, uh, the Safety Act, for instance, that came about because of the coalition and money bond. Uh, community control of police came about in Chicago because of the Chicago Alliance Against Racist Political Repression uh, in tandem with um, you know, a broad movement of religious uh, community and labor organizations. The Workers' Rights Amendment, that was because the entire labor movement of, of Illinois came out to support it um, and knocked doors for, for, for months before the, uh, the 2022 midterm, right? The Patient Provider Protection Act, that came about because of Equality Illinois and countless of LGBTQ organizations across the state uh, who, who lobbied for this to happen, right? This was not given to us. This was this was done by the mass movement, and we know this because we were a part of it, right? People in Illinois, in the party, in the district, were a part of these movements, uh, and we were successful in bringing about th this change collectively. Um, and that's what I kind of want to put forth uh, with the upcoming presidential election. Yes, Biden does not represent these mass movements. Um, 
Trump does represent the fascist MAGA movement, though. Um, and Biden, on the other hand, kind of represents what the mass movement at its current state can organize. Um, but at the same time, he, he's not going to, he, Biden's not going to do all the things that we want him to do. Absolutely not. But at least we have the ability to organize the mass movement, right? We have the ability uh, to, to fight for the things that we fought for in Illinois on a national level. Uh, and I think that's just as important. So that's the the shining light, at least for 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 the upcoming uh, election. Um, but I think it's really important that we can only go together um, in unity. You know, we can only have unity of action. That's where we're going to be able to defeat fascism. So we can only go together um, as the pre-convention uh, discussion uh, talks about uh, forward together. And, and that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Noah. Uh, we will now open the floor for uh, questions and comments. Isaiah, your mic is open on our end. Hello, guys. Uh, so my question is, fingers crossed, let's say we do end up defeating Trump in this next election and uh, a Biden uh, administration wins another term. What is our plan after that? Because the fascist threat obviously won't just go away. What is our long term sort of plan for fighting fascism um, beyond, uh, I guess, just the electoral sphere? How can we bring that fight down to the ground and uh, more effectively fight it, you know, hearts and minds, stuff like that? Thank you, Isaiah. OK, Kyle, your mic is open on our end. Hi, thank you, Noah. Uh, listening to your uh, stance on the Democrat Party is the sole viable uh, means of securing the rights between uh, a duopoly uh, situation that we have. Uh, what is the the plan? Let's just assume that that Biden gets chosen again for the next four years. Um, we should expect the possibility of one a death in office. Uh, two, uh, what is our plan to continue forward? Uh, whoever replaces him. Because regardless, another four years we're looking at um, for the next 10, 20, both parties use each other as catalysts. So us not necessarily being Democrat, um, we, need, we need to have an actual um, six months, one year plan, uh, both on grassroots, uh, city, state, um, because they are going to use the state um, powers at at every level in order to create obstacles to prevent us from making progress. Thank you, Kyle. We will take a few more comments and questions for this round before we turn it back over to Noah. All right, Alexander, your mic is open on our end. Hello. Um, we're trying to run in elections here in Virginia. We want to create dual power. We also want to have inside outside group strategy to uh, affect change. So basically, how would you go? I know that we've run in local elections with the Communist Party uh, here and there, like like with uh, Tony, Pe Tony Pesanovsky and Justine Medina in New York. Um, to give some examples, and uh, Joe Sims wants us to start running in elections again. Uh, I don't believe that we should focus on the presidential elections, of course, that's, that's a PSL thing. It would be much better if we ran in local elections and labor union elections. Uh, do you have any advice for how we can run in elections here in Virginia, in the local and state and municipal levels? Uh, because that's what we plan to do, actually. That's what my DO and my chair, club chair and uh, everyone else plans to do. So thank you. Thank you, That's Alexander. Uh, let's take one more uh, for this round. Okay, Lori, your mic is open on our end. Thanks, Dee. I really appreciated that presentation, Noah. That, that was great. Um, my question is, um, you know, coming from the idea that ultimately, um, we are going to have to change minds on the other side, on the um, MAGA masses and the, the fascist masses. 
And I wonder if the texts that you've consulted and you know pulled great quotes from to help us understand what fascism is offer insight into you know sort of um, what is uh, motivating um, those you know masses and how one you know engages with them in a, in a productive way. Okay, uh, we will turn the mic uh, uh, back over to Noah for brief responses. Then we will open, um, we will take another round of uh, comments and questions. Uh, let me say though, uh, Noah is a young Marxist. Please don't uh, uh, take the weight, as we used to say, please don't feel you have to take the weight to answer everything, uh, pick and choose. Uh, absolutely, and don't take what I'm going to say with a grain of salt, too, right? Because I don't know everything. Um, uh, but I think the the first two questions, right? Like, what is our long term goal of fighting fascism, uh, and like, how do we replace, uh, you know, the you know Biden and upcoming elections? I think those are really connected because I think what it really is uh, the solution is building the mass movement. Um, we need to be a part of, of these coalitions that are coming together, like Chicago Alliance Against Racist Political Repression. I think they're they're part of the National Alliance, right? So like they're probably branches all across the country. Uh, we need to be a part of those things, um, and we need to be fighting for their interests, you know, fighting for their policies. Um, and that by itself, you know, I, I think is really the huge step um, in fighting fascism long term. We need to have a robust, strong progressive mass movement. Um, to the question about running candidates uh, in Virginia, I obviously, I don't know the the, uh, the conditions in Virginia. I'm in central Illinois, um, so that's com it's very different. Um, but I will say like, uh, just speaking from what we've done here, we haven't run any candidates, but the nice thing about our area is like city council and uh, the school board and a lot of these uh, smaller local offices, they're all nonpartisan, meaning it's not like Democrat or Republican or anything like that. Um, and what you can do there is you can really rely on the mass movements in your community uh, to put forward, either put it forward a candidate from their movement, right? You know, we want to be pushing for working class leadership in the mass movement, um, and that involves electing working class people from it. Um, but also, you know, getting getting good relationships with their being a part of that mass movement and eventually building that relationship for their pushing you as a candidate. I think that's really important um, to Lori's question, um, you know, talking about you know, changing the minds of the fascist movement. I'm glad you kind of brought this up. Togliatti talks about this in Lectures of Fascism, um, that this mass movement of small business, right, this mass movement of the petty bourgeois, uh, they're they're, we're able to influence them, and it's almost a requirement for us to influence them. Um, and what is motivating them, like uh, from what Togliatti was mentioning, I believe he was saying that it's really just frustration with capitalism, ironically enough. You know, uh, uh, we see this in our community. Small businesses are being pushed out by large, you know, monopoly capital uh, every single day. Um, that's one of the major concerns in almost pretty much every city um, uh, for, for, you know, small businesses. It's just like, how do we compete? Um, so that's that's probably one of their biggest motivating factors. Um, that's it. Okay, so we'll open the floor for questions and comments one more time. All right, Brian, your mic is open on, on our end. There you are. Uh, hello, thank you for the presentation, Noah. Um, I do have a question though, because I I'm sort of struggling to understand the earlier questions of what is our plan of action afterwards, but if we're supposed to be fighting fascism now, what's the plan then? Because I, I see I see the discussion around Biden and, and the Democrats and this governor in Illinois, and that's fantastic context. But in terms of actual, like actionable things to do as members of the party, I'm finding that when we discuss this, there's not a lot of actual, hey, this is what we should do. And I'm still kind of confused as to what the uh, the plan afterwards is because saying building the mass movement is great, but like, what 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 does that mean? You know, thank you. I don't know how to like. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, okay, looking for raised hands. If you'd like to make a contribution, please 
raise your hand and we will call on you as well. Um, Molly, your mic is open. Please open. There you are. Uh, Noah, phenomenal job. Um, that was just really clear and digestible. Um, I think that that's one of the biggest challenges um, as a communist to be able to, um, uh, you know, reinterpret and process this information of our strategy on a national level um, into an everyday. Um, and I just really, really thank you. It's something that I'm still, you know, I think a lot of us, when we're confronted with these conversations, we try to, again and it comes out like Greek, you know, and you're just like, okay, I'll <laughs> keep going for the next time. So um, that's a lot of the reason why um, I think it's important that we had this, that we are having this discussion. And I, and I hope that there's plans for, for you to share this presentation, or I hope you're interested in that um, in a more broader basis. Um, so uh, I'd love to like invite you to do that, uh, like on a local level. But um, I guess uh, when it comes to the questions of concrete things, and you know, after after the election, I'll just give you, you know, an example. Here in Ohio, we have a very very powerful um, fascist control over our state government. Um, and so, you know, there's just endless amount of things that can be done um, if if um, the fascists are defeated at the federal level here in Ohio. So I think it really depends on where you are. Um, but, you know, one of the things that's important is that we are linking the struggles of our class together and we're bringing conversations around healthcare and conversations around trans rights and conversations around uh, the fossil fuel corruption um, it, together with the, the electoral and democratic struggles. So, what, you know, if that's something like a panel that organizing that, and another thing is just like talking to people um uh, door to door you know there's the b movement building is a is is a there's just you'll f what you what what i think is necessary when someone's asking that question is to find a community leader because i'm sure they'll put you to work though <laughs> they'll have plenty of things to do so yeah that's my comment thank you so much all right looking for uh one or two more comments or questions all right, Chris, your mic is open on our end. There you are. Hi, thanks, comrades. Uh, Noah, thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, but I just wanted to pose, I guess, like a question out there that, uh, so in terms of building the mass movement and I guess the um, orientation that that takes, um, the orientation of the mass movement saying, uh, if we associate and articulate a socialist politics around new democratic forms, um, wouldn't that, so as that mass movement begins to associate with socialist demands, uh, communist demands, wouldn't that necessarily begin to undermine um, the entrenched neoliberal strata within the Democrat party? Um, because I understand you know, the Democrat Party has, uh, it's, kind of, it's almost like a coalition party in a way that it has different sections. Um, so yeah, that's that's the question I'm posing is that as we build this socialist movement and it reaches like more of a concrete, you know, uh, demand that democratic procedures change um, for the sake of, you know, continuing progress, wouldn't we begin to undermine a certain section of Democrats and, you know, I guess, how do we go forward from there? Because that that would be a question to grapple with, you know, post a Biden re-election, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And we'll take Joe. There you are. Okay. Um, thank you, Noah. I agree with everybody. It's a, a great presentation and great questions. And thank you for your answers. And the questions are tough. There's some tough questions. Um, 
You know, I think that um, one of the things that we should be aware of is that we won't have fascism if Trump is elected. Um, there, there, there's going to be a struggle, you know, uh, over Project 2025. And I think that um, that's when the danger will grow greatest, you know, uh, over the fight uh, to implement that program. And it will, it, it will um, depend on our, and when I use the word our, I mean the working class and democratic movements, small d, but also some big D Democrats will be in there too, to push back and build unity in that movement, you know? Um, and with respect to, um, cause Trump and that, those people are nuts, you know? You saw what they did. I, I, I keep thinking, I've been thinking about this over, over the last few days when um, they had occupied Lafayette Square, you know, uh, and Trump wanted to march to that church. Somebody had defaced the church to hold up the Bible. And they used the military to, and the federal police to bust up. That's kind of, you know, the nature of, you know, what. And, and then you had Flynn and them cats urging that they used the Insurrection Act to bring out the federal troops to squash the Black Lives Matter movement. And so, I mean, those are the kinds of forces that we're you know, going to be uh, uh, dealing with as those protests arise. And, and so I think that in answer to the uh, program for the first year, um, it kind of depends on who is elected, you know, what are we going to do? It depends on who's elected, whether or not Trump and MAGA are going to be elected or whether there's a Democratic administration in the White House um, and a uh, big D Democratic, and this is even more important in some respects, a big D Democratic victory in the House and the Senate and in the state legislatures and governorships and so on and so forth. Um, and, and so I think that one of the things that we have to think about and one of the things that the convention has to think about is what are we going to do in the first 100 days of either a Trump administration in terms of focusing on building the fight back or uh, if the uh, uh, Biden-Harris ticket um, wins. What are we going to do in the first 100 days? And one of the problems uh, that, that, that we had um, at the be in, in January 2020 is that the political platform that had been uh, adopted by the administration around jobs, around the environment, around women's rights, around LGBTQ rights. Uh, there was no mass movement pushing for that program, you know? Um, and so when we say build mass movements, we mean build support for those legislative and political initiatives um, that if passed will, it's, it's, it's kind of like that Illinois program that, that you put forward. Uh, no, uh, you, you know what I mean? Those are the issues that we need to build mass movements around. Um, and I, so I, I think that, that in terms of what we're going to do in the first 100 days and the uh, first uh, year, depending on who is elected, will we'll, we'll be to uh, build on the ground support in our communities with, uh, by, by means of our clubs uh, around the very specific ways those programs are going to impact us, you know, 
either in favor of legislation or against, you know, and and uh, and I think that uh, and 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 the last thing I want to say is that um, the party has to put forward its own vision and its own um, political program and platform as we go forward. And we haven't done enough of that. In other words, that this is great, but this is how we see solving these problems. And I think that that's another thing that the convention has to uh, address. What is our legislative and political uh, program? That's all. Thank you again, Noah. All right, thank you. At this time, we'll turn the floor back over to Noah for responses and summary. Uh, thank you all for the, the questions and the input. Um, uh, I'll start with the, the first question there. Uh, what does it mean to build uh, the mass movement? And that that is, Joe was right, that is a tough question. Uh, uh, like, how do you tackle that? That's a, that's a big one. Um, but I, I immediately think back to that slogan that we have on the, on the swag store t-shirt, you know, uh, community, it's in the name, right? Uh, and I think I think it starts there. Um, Joe Joe talked about you know tackling the uh, the the issues of working class people, um, and I, I think that's exactly right. I think our program talks about um, meeting and fighting for the immediate demands of working class people at the same time, uh, looking po towards the uh, the future, you know, the road to socialism. Um, and I I think it, it to build the mass movement, it starts here in the local. Um, you know, getting involved um, in your local LGBTQ organization, getting involved in your local labor uh, union, right, or, you know, for, for your workplace, um, or, or getting involved in organizations like the NAACP. Um, because uh, just from my experience, these organizations at the local level, they need help. Um, they, need, they need hands, they need bodies, they need people to go out um, and do those things. Um, so I, I would say uh, start local. Um, and obviously there's much more to that, but I'll, I'll let other people kind of build on that as the pre-convention uh, discussions go. Um, uh, towards the question um, is as we build the mass movement um, and uh, the mass movement starts to, to uh, you know, fight for um, more left policies, would that start to undermine the Dems, the Democratic Party, right? Um, after my March Madness bracket, I don't I don't want to try to predict the future because <laughs> I've been I've been terrible at it. Uh, but I I will say that that is definitely a, a possibility. Um, but I think the the beautiful thing in the the mass movement is that um, that that's the power of working class people. It's not necessarily in elections. Um, uh, that's just one tool in the toolbox the toolboxes as Joe Sims have said before. Um, but I, I think uh, I think the mass movement um, in building that and, and creating it more powerful uh, that's that's where we get power from. Um, so I, I wouldn't be overly concerned about that. Um, to to sum up, um, I, I think the discussion here was was really great. Uh, something I forgot to mention um, is is that the MAGA movement um, it's it's not just Trump. Right, it's not just DeSantis. Um, it is a mass movement at the federal level, at the state level, um, at the city council level, at the school board level. Um, I've even seen, you know, the MAGA movement in my local park district. Right, um, and in order to fight against that, uh, we we need to be just as united, build just as big of a, of a mass movement, a progressive, democratic uh, uh, mass movement. Um, so I, I really push for people as we go through the convention process to really be looking at things pragmatically, um, taking reality as it comes to us um, and, and look at our strategy on how we can unite these progressive forces against that. Um, so that's all, that's all I have. All right, thank you so much, Noah. Um, again, um, I, I'll speak for everyone. We appreciate the work you did to uh, make this contribution to helping us understand uh, the present moment in which we're struggling, the reality, the realities we face. Thank everyone for joining us this morning. And again, we invite you to come back April 7th, where we will continue the conversation and we will examine how do we navigate contradiction 
in using examples from nature and social life. Thank you so much. We look forward to continuing the, the conversation. Thank you, Noah. Thanks, Dee. Good day, everyone.